pain was not unusual in those who came to the Grande Ospedale della Vita e della Morte in Bologna, Italy. But never more evident than in the horde waiting for treatment today. Nora was used to these beleaguered souls who hobbled, limped, or were carried to Via Riva di Reno from the alleys of the Quadrilatero. She'd walked those narrow medieval streets herself this morning, to the aptly named Grand Hospital of Life and Death, but with a brisk and resolute step, not like the fearful, sick and bleeding sufferers who came from that slum in endless succession, day after day. The trouble was, even with her best attention, a brilliantly deduced diagnosis and skilled treatment, too much depended on chance. She surveyed the registration room with a practised eye, silently praying she'd be accurate in her winnowing. Life and death. Screams, pleas and whimpers, however striking, were less important than their causes, and causes needed to be determined quickly. A quiet fever, if ignored, would spread through the air if the patient wasn't quarantined. Broken arms, though agonizing, must be forced to wait. Dottoressa! A boy holding a younger child reached for Nora's arm. She wasn't a doctor, not yet, but the title brought a flush to her cheeks. Soon. Un momento, Nora said, her eyes flying past him to a woman leaning against the hospital door, silhouetted against the late afternoon sun. Her breath was as laboured and ponderous as the music of a child forced to thump out exercises on the piano. Forgetting the seeping wound on the cheek of the young child in front of her, Nora hurried to the woman's side. Signora, what's wrong? She was poor, obviously. In labour, obviously. But women delivered their babies at home. They did not shuffle down hot, dusty streets, shielding their bellies one-handed to this hospital, especially when there were so many cases of erysipelas in the wards. The highly contagious fever kept many would-be patients from seeking help, because the people of this city seized and scattered bad news of the hospital before even the doctors caught wind of it. It's been a day and a night. I need help, the woman gasped, then gritted her teeth as a contraction seized her, only moments after the last. Piero, quick, Nora called, as she took the woman's weight on her arm. At this rate, they might not make it inside. Piero, the burliest orderly, swooped in with a wheeled chair, collected the woman, and swerved past the registration desk without breaking his stride. Impervious to protests from the crowd of waiting patients, he wheeled the woman down the corridor to the women's ward. Nora raced after him. Unable to find an empty bed, she hastily erected a scream. Not much time with this one, eh? Piero whispered to Nora. Maybe I should just leave her in the chair. Nora frowned, recalling the woman's statement. It's been a day and a night. It won't be much longer, Nora said to the woman. What had she been thinking, trekking here? Put her on the table so I can take a look, she told Piero. In spite of the woman's ungainly shape and agonized groans, Piero swung her easily onto the table, as Nora set aside bundles of fresh linen and the carefully blended bottles of liniment and neatly pressed pills from Sister Madonna Agnes's pharmacy. As soon as she had room to work, Nora lifted away the ragged skirts, the hems stained the same perpetual rusty brown as everything else in the city. She paused in surprise, for she fully expected to see the head crowning. But it didn't even look like the fluids had ruptured. And when Nora felt for the head, she found almost no cervical dilation at all.